Chair, um, and I want to thank you and the ranking member for having this hearing, and I want to thank our witnesses for all that you are doing uh, to help your students and our communities. Between the COVID-19 crisis and the rightful outrage following the killing of George Floyd, this is a deeply challenging time for our country. That is true at our institutions of higher education. And as we grapple with how to reopen safely during a global pandemic, we must also remember that higher education institutions have historically served as places of civil discourse. As our local communities and our country works together to make our systems more equitable and just, I look forward to working with all of you. Um, my first question is to our three college presidents. Last week, I sent a bipartisan letter to Secretary DeVos with Senators Tim Scott, Leffler, and Booker, urging the Department of Education to immediately ensure that students receive the financial aid that they are now eligible for due to the economic impacts of COVID-19. Specifically, we asked the department to issue guidance to colleges to help ensure that students' financial aid eligibility can be appropriately adjusted and to update the online FAFSA form to capture recent changes in income for financial aid applicants. So to each of the college uh, presidents, and I'll start with you, uh, President Daniels, can you speak to how your students have been economically impacted by COVID-19? I know you've done it a little bit through this hearing, but more importantly, why further action by the Department of Education is needed to help ensure that students get the financial aid that they are eligible for? Well, Senator, I, I can't say that we know yet. We're in the process of finding out now which students uh, who have expressed a, a desire to come to Purdue will finally come and, and can, can manage it. And I don't doubt that many of them have encountered a economic, significant economic setback since they express that intention. We'll, we'll know much more over the next few weeks. I'm hoping that most of them will be able to do it. But I applaud uh, the uh, initiative that you led and, uh, and those who joined you in it. And clearly, we all need to do all we can to uh, get aid more, more swiftly and directly and flexibly, which is a point I think you uh, uh, just uh, uh, drew our attention to, uh, uh, to every young person who needs it. And thank you. Uh, President Hampton? receive a Pell Grant. It is no question that our students have been negatively impacted by COVID-19. When we did our survey of our students, uh, that survey went to the students about five weeks after the majority of our students had been home. And those students reported back to us while they were at home, 78% of them said, I need help with food. 73% with food. of them said, I need help with housing. Our students need the help now. They will need the help in the fall. They did their FAFSA based on the previous income. Those incomes have now dropped. Their families will have less means to help them come August. So whether we're online or whether we're face-to-face -face or whether we're hybrid, our students need the help as a result of COVID-19 and the vicious effects of racism on their parents' income. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Paxson. So after the 2008 recession, uh, financial aid at Brown rose by 12%. Uh, the maximum unemployment rate during that recession was 10%. We're heading to 20%. Uh, we're also hearing from students who are saying, I know my FAFSA was correct, but it is no longer in any way an accurate portrayal of my family's economic circumstances. So we are having to go back and, and revisit all of, all of those aid awards because we're in, a, we're in an extraordinary time for students and their families. Well, thank you. Um, I want to turn to Dr. Benjamin now, if I can. And I know, Dr. Benjamin, you have talked uh, a bit in your answers about what colleges need to do from a public health uh, point of view, including robust testing and contact tracing as part of their strategy um, as they reopen. Uh, but you've also spoken about even with the best public health protocols in place to ensure that students, faculty, and staff practice social distancing, recommended hand washing, and wear masks, it's likely inevitable that there will be spikes in cases on college campuses. So what protocols do you believe should be in place to contain a detected spike in cases on college campuses? And if colleges are forced to close, 
what can be done to ensure that students leaving campus do not spread the virus in their own communities? And they absolutely, um, the reason I recommended that they link very closely with their, their state and local health departments is so that they can very quickly um, get involved in contact tracing and disease containment. Um, because in many cases, these will involve the community as well. And, you know, the, they, they should have plans for that. They should have pre-written um, guidelines for how they're going to handle it, who's, who's on first, how they're going to manage it, who's the spokesperson for the university. Um, how, do they, you know, how do they link um, protocols with the state and local health department? so that um, there's no debate about who's actually managing the disease outbreak. I would assume that in most cases, the contact tracing activity will be, uh, will be done by the state or local health department and not the university, but it depends on how big the community health program is uh, at the university. They may very well want to be involved in that. But if you don't have plans for that, it, it will be um, at, better, at best a mess. So it does require a fair amount of planning uh, upfront and for all the various scenarios that they can possibly think of um, would be, would be uh, important for them to do. Well, thank you. And Mr. Chair, I have lost uh, sight of the clock um, on my screen. I'm afraid. So I'm, I'm going to assume that's about five minutes. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Senator Hassan. Now,